Um, our first session is from Clyde & Co about creating a diverse workforce from the ground up. Um, so we've got James Gordanifar from Clyde & Co who's going to talk us through that. Um, as I said, there is a Q&A. So if you've got questions, do pop them in there. We'll be facilitating them towards the end. Um, so thanks to James for coming along today. I'll hand over um, and James is going to James is going to drive this session. So thanks, James, and welcome. No problem at all. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm very excited to be here. Can we say that virtually? I'm here um, and uh, looking forward to sharing our perspective with you around diversity and, and how to build a diverse and inclusive workforce from the ground up. So I'm just going to share my presentation and Jane, maybe just give me a nod or something that this has come through. OK, so just bear with me. There we go. All good. Perfect. OK, good stuff. So good morning, everybody. Uh, as Jane mentioned, my name is James Gordanifer and I lead early careers at Clyde & Co. Um, for those of you that don't know, Clyde & Co is a global law firm, um, full service law firm with a, a particular uh, emphasis and, and, and brand with the insurance space where we're a global leader around insurance. Um, and we, uh, we are very passionate about diversity and inclusion. Uh, early careers and early talent with many law firms is, is an absolute fundamental driving force of our future. Um, and it is most likely that the, the, the biggest single lever that you can pull within the workforce um, to be able to really transform the shape and the, and the nature of your organization from a diverse perspective. There are, of course, many other components to diversity throughout an organization, but early careers is recognized as a really key lever across um, not just the industry, but the, the market as a whole. So, you know, I'm very passionate about it myself. Um, and if I think about kind of the experiences I've had as an individual, you know, I, I've been very fortunate in terms of my journey. Um, you know, I went to a great school, a, a grammar school, at, you know, for, for secondary school. Uh, I have two degrees. I'm fortunate enough to go on, gone to university twice um, and then, you know, kind of progress through my career with, with little resistance from, from a diversity perspective. But when you start to learn more about it, certainly when you're in a position like mine, some of the um, stories and the experiences that you hear about what talent have experienced um, can really open your eyes to, to the nature of the world of work. Um, if I think about my own perspective, my, my dad, my, my name is from Iran and my dad is Persian. Uh, he studied over here um, and he left university in the early 80s and he really struggled to get a role at that point. Um, and it was very, very pronounced in terms of his experience. And even since, you know, he lives in Canada now, even since he's had to, to change his first name um, to be more westernized and, and recognized for him to progress through his career. Now, I, I admit the world has moved on when he, he went through his experience was through the kind of 80s and 90s to build his career. But, you know, there are still remnants of that across organizations. And I think I see a big um, responsibility around the type of work that I do and, and organizations in general to really kind of change that approach. Um, so I'm going to share with you the journey that we're on. I think it's important to say that uh, it by no means is, means is it perfect. By no means are we there. I don't think anywhere is. Um, and we're all, you know, pardon the expression, on a journey. Um, but the key thing is to be aware to that and to be open-minded and, and, and to learn and iterate as you go through, which I think that you'll get from the kind of work that we're exploring and we're doing at the moment, or at least I hope so, at least. So I'm going to frame kind of the market and kind of the state of play. Uh, and then I'm going to talk more about um, Clyde & Co and the work that we've done. So if I think about the student market, you know, and what we're experiencing at the moment, um, Generation Z, and I know that you're all very, very close to this in terms of the, the, the nature of work that you do. You know, there are some really key drivers amongst this generation and, and a very, I'd say, kind of socially conscious, ethically conscious kind of um, driving force that sits behind um, the, the, the students that we engage with, certainly as a, as a collective, as a general theme. Um, and this piece of research came from Bright Network, who, you know, a prolific supplier within the student recruitment space. 
and it was all about what what um, students want to see from a potential employer and you can see there's a whole range of, uh, of factors there um, but you know the the, the, the strongest um, determining factor in terms of what they want to see from a potential employer was around an inclusive and diverse workforce and actually when you when you dig deeper um, and you look at what students really want, you know, we, we, I, I attended a conference recently and, and, and a study that was shared in that conference showed that students will actively research whether your organisation uh, it, it is, is genuinely committed to diversity and inclusion. Um, and 50% of them, so half of those students won't apply if through their research they get a sense that your culture doesn't support diversity and inclusion. So, so it's that pronounced, you know, in order for us to attract and to engage with the best talent in the market, you know, we have to demonstrate that we're a diverse and inclusive employer. And that's just one factor of it. It's, it's obviously the right thing to do. It has business benefits, all of those kind of elements. So. You know, from a student market point of view, it's absolutely critical that employers are, are, are doing that and showing that commitment. The other piece is then around the business need. And I, I, I'm sure you're familiar with, you know, many of the um, business benefits associated with having a diverse workforce around multiple perspectives, you know, better decision making processes more innovation, enrichment of ideas. But then when you look at the, the, the picture of the, you know, how the market is pulled together and you can see from this slide, you know, the, the, the challenge within law firms particularly is acute. You know, the, the, the undergraduate market, as it says here is 41% uh, from an ethnic minority. Um, but then when you look at the legal sector, and particularly as you go further up the organisation, there is a really acute need to address the, the imbalance and that's recognised within firms. And you can see um, in the top right of this slide, you know, organisations are moving in the right direction. There is a definite commitment to that. And, I, and I'm pleased to say that with, you know, within Clyde & Co, we have a fully fledged uh, d &I strategy that has been signed off by our global management board. There is a real commitment to change the nature of the workforce at that senior level so at board level and a commitment to bring more diverse talent through uh, at that senior level but equally as well obviously the, as mentioned the, the the focus within early careers is absolutely critical and you can see here the, the one example on here that I've put around um, the percentage of students that are that, that, that uh, attend state school versus what that looks like in, in law firms and there is a significant gap between the two and there's lots of factors that drive that but it you know being tuned into that and, and aware of it is really key so you know as i say we're, we're kind of on that journey there's there's lots to do but this is the state of play within certainly within the legal sector so then when i think about um what's happening within the uh the actual um society at large I want to kind of share with you some statistics um, that really are quite um, hard hitting, um, particularly around uh, students from a black ethnic minority where um, from a diversity standpoint and that particular strand is really, really pronounced right now um, within the market. So. I can't profess that you know an organisation like ours can solve the problem because it's much bigger. But being aware of the problem and the role that you play within it, I think, is absolutely critical. So you know, the, on the slide here, you'll see um, as we build through kind of a, a student's journey within the kind of early years of life before they even enter education. You know, black um, black people from a black ethnic minority are far more likely to be born into uh, income poverty um, than than any other ethnic uh, ethnic group um, and there's other, you know lots of other stats that are within here but the, you know there's a whole kind of um, starting point there that then drives what happens then within education which I'm sure that you you know you're closer to and aware but you're kind of building through what I call almost like a cumulative cumulative bias until you reach an organization so then when that comes through to education what's happening at that perspective well you'll see here and i'm sure many of you are from russell group universities the attendance rates at um, wider universities versus Russell Group universities is significantly pronounced. And then when you look at the attainment of students within universities, black students achieve a 2 1 and at, you know, 56 percent on average versus 81 uh, percent white students with the same A level grades. Um, so, you know, we've got this whole piece playing out then within education. And then when you look at what happens within the job market, you know, the, the, the most shocking thing for me when I 
kind of started to really understand this and learn it was that black students submit 60% more applications on average than white students be before receiving a positive response. So you build all of this together. And as I say, it creates what, what, you know, what I would term as a cumulative bias that we have to be so tuned into as an employer. Um, and for something that I've learned recently, and this might, you know, in the kind of role that I have, and I've, I've been in early career, I've been in recruitment for over 12 years, but in early careers for the best part of seven years now, you know, was really understanding the difference between equality and equity. Um, and, you know, that was a really big learn for me this year. You know, I'd always been talking about equality and fairness for all and so on, but actually it goes further than that. And for us, it's a commitment about understanding the, the background to certain demographics and certain groups and, you know, the, the struggles that they face to be able to look at how can we support that demographic and level the playing field to ensure that they have more of a fair opportunity uh, at employment with employers like ourselves. So. I just wanted to kind of go through this section because I think it frames why we do what we do um, and all of the interventions that we're looking to to make and, and, the, and the journey that we're on as well. So if we kind of rewind back and think about where we were as an organisation, this is the picture in 2017, so four years ago, obviously, you know, we, we were you know, from a, from a, you know, and if I compare it to my previous employer, so I was at um, EY previously and I joined Clive and Co in uh, June. So I've been here about five months. You know, the picture in 2017 was dramatically different. And, you know, we were significantly behind where we should be in terms of, you know, just the right thing to do, but also in terms of where the market was. So there was a real um, need to drive improvement. So the starting point could could really only go up from where we were. And a lot of the drivers for that were, it was a very, very traditional approach to uh, early careers and student recruitment. You know, the, the, the employer brand at the time um, was quite um, corporate, quite formal, um, you know, and I'm sure, again, from the roles that you have, you're probably aware that it doesn't really resonate with Generation Z. And so, you know, there was, a, and, and certainly in terms of kind of, you know, people of, of different uh, ethnic minorities or different gender or different other strands of DNI being visible in our process and in our collateral, it just wasn't the case. Um, and so that was one of, one of the driving factors. The approach to campus recruitment was ve very traditional. You know, it was very much, these are our set of Russell Group universities that we've been to for the past, you know, 10, 15 years, and we'll continue going to those because that's where all of our partners have come from. Um, you know, so very much that kind of approach. Um, and there was very little, interaction with third parties who had a specialism in this space and who, who could help take us on a journey or potentially cut through certain demographics and speak to that audience in a much more effective way. Um, and in terms of the recruitment process itself, like many other recruitment processes within the early career space, I'm, I'm sad to say still, um, was focusing on previous experience rather than looking at potential and what, what a candidate or a student could could add, um, not necessarily based on what they'd done in the past or had the opportunity to be exposed to. So those are some of the factors as to why we probably were where we were. So what did we do differently? Um, there's probably a few bits to, to, to call out and, and, and to give you some uh, insight on that I would say were important. Um, the first thing is we looked at our employer brand and we looked at particularly our website um, and we updated it to be more um, modern and to speak to Generation Z and to have more of that kind of uh, uh, feel that would, would appeal to our audience. Um, and part of that as well was demonstrating uh, ourselves as a more diverse and inclusive employer um, through having imagery of, of where um, you know, individuals come from different demographics. So that, that was a key step forward for us. And to bring that, that conversation into the collateral um, and to the presentations that we would, we, we would deliver at, um, at events. We also looked at the representation that we had um, on campus um, and at events as well to challenge ourselves as to whether it was diverse um, and and students could uh, see or see role models or were reflected kind of in themselves what they were looking for from from an organization so those are some of the kind of initial interventions that we made we also started to explore uh, more targeted events and i should say this links to partnerships and i'm you know a big believer in this from a student perspective it's difficult for an employer like us to be all things to all people 
um, but there are specific partnerships that are experts in this space that have a real understanding of a particular demographic that are able to reach an audience in a way that we would never be able to. And so working with those partnerships has been a really key step forward for us. And I mentioned Bright Network earlier in terms of the uh, work that we've done. You know, we've had some really great steps forward and initiatives working with that particular partnership as an example. The other thing that we've done differently um, is that we've embedded contextualized data into the recruitment process um, with a tool called Rare. So rather than looking at purely the attainment that an individual has uh, achieved at a university or at school, um, we try to look at that in context. Um, and it brings in you know, other factors and other measures around social mobility, for example, that will demonstrate whether or not that individual has had greater social mobility distance traveled so that we can take that into account when looking at who we select in for the next stages of the recruitment process. So that's been a really key determining factor and, and a step forward for us. And I would say the, the other key component that was different that we have really started to see you know, the only way to demonstrate our, or to build our own understanding in this space is to measure what we're doing to know what's working and where we're seeing return on investment. So being able to, to measure that has been a step forward as well. So I'd say those are some of the components that, that we've certainly benefited from. One particular kind of strand that I'd like to pull out um, and is really important within early talent and, and, and certainly for, for us, but also broader organisations that are seeing success in this space is to build pipeline a pipeline of talent much earlier through specific insight programs um, and we we developed and launched a program called bright futures um, which is really aimed at cutting through that social mobility strand um, and you know in order to be eligible um, students have to have demonstrated um, you know a, a high level of social mobility distance traveled um, and you know it really kind of speaks to an audience that in in the legal sector as, as i showed in terms of the slides earlier you know is somewhere where we really need to make an impact in terms of opening access so the program itself is a is a is a aimed at first year students within universities um it's uh, a week-long work experience uh, and then they also have the opportunity to receive kind of one-on-one -on -one support and coaching and mentoring throughout the rest of the program and it's a paid experience as well which is you know obviously a really important factor into the designing of a program that's meaningful um, and these students have a high probability of going on to our um, uh, assessment events through to our vacation schemes which happen you know, in the second year of university, and then ultimately onto the training contract. So it builds a pipeline of specific talent that is really, really uh, relevant to us as an organisation, but equally as well, meaningful to the market and uh, us demonstrating that we're trying to do more in this space. And, you know, pleased to say that we, you know, we have won an award around this particular programme, um, you know, which, which was great for the team, but it was, you know, been a really key lever that we've been able to pull. So if I fast forward to this year um, and what the state of play is uh, and how things have improved, you know, you can see we've really turned the dial on ethnic diversity. Um, and, uh, you know, we've seen the makeup of our intakes significantly change from, from that perspective. We, we've always done quite well, and I think the legal sector as a whole in terms of a male-female split. Um, so that, that hasn't really been a challenge for us as it is for, for other sectors such as technology or accountancy and so on. Um, we've been able to increase representation from non-Russell Group University, so that's that's changed significantly, and we continue to strive and to do more in that space as well. Um, and we're tracking other metrics now and bringing other components in that we've not really drilled down on or looked at in specific detail. So you can see there, you know, kind of in terms of um, the number of students that we've hired with uh, who've registered with a disability as well. And we've picked up a number of awards on the way for the work that we've done, which are demonstrated on the screen. Um, and, you know, we're very, very proud of, you know, what we've been able to do and, and be able to turn the dialogue. But there are a number of components that we need to do more on, which I've tried to highlight in the next slide. And, then, you know, I, I'm conscious of needing to kind of jump to uh, a q and if there's any questions and so on. But let me just walk you through a few of these and, and my perspective on, I guess, why they're important for us. Um, the, the role models piece, so I'll start with this, is, is absolutely critical. You know, we, we've got to demonstrate in the market in, an, in a truly authentic way that we are a diverse and inclusive employer. There are, there are a lot of employers that say it and it's on the website 
um, but do they really live and breathe it? And I think we're really challenging ourselves on what we're calling the lived experience. And you know, we're trying to be very honest and authentic in our messaging. Some of the Im images I showed you on the updated website, for example, we're challenging ourselves around those and saying, actually, students want to see people like them real people in the role doing the role that that have a much broader kind of you know makeup of, of what our intake looks like you know so we want to really kind of refresh what we're doing in the market and put our role models front and center so whether it's through collateral or whether it's through events you know that's a, that's an absolutely critical kind of um component that, that we're working on at the moment the other piece is the data uh, approach. You know, historically, we you know we haven't been as acutely aware of the mechanics of how all the the flow of the the market looks like, how that then um, uh, flows through the recruitment process and ultimately goes through the organisation as well. We're really challenging ourselves on cutting each uh, demographic and each perspective and thinking much more like a, a marketing function, if you will, um, to be able to see what is demonstrating a return on investment. If it doesn't make the boat go faster, we won't do it. So, you know, we're taking a pretty ruthless approach to what that means to the campuses and the schools that we uh, that, that we engage with, for example, um, and also market data more broadly than our own because if we hire in the same model that we always have we'll get the same result so challenging ourselves on whether we should be engaging more broadly but using data to lead us there so that's that's a really key thing that we're working on moving forward um you know we've spoken about the bright futures program but actually we can go further than this and you know i have experience of taking particular strands of diversity and really speaking to that audience in a meaningful way through insight programs much earlier on in the student's journey rather than just focusing on you know the second or the or the final year when you need to recruit and building pipeline at a much earlier stage by having a meaningful conversation with that audience that that's something that we're we're deploying and looking at at the moment for the next recruitment cycle so taking certain strands of diversity and social inclusion and and taking that conversation proactively to market through our partnerships Something that we've embedded this year uh, is called the Coaching Academy. So I mentioned the difference between equality and equity. So we are proactively taking to market uh, coaching for certain uh, students from underrepresented groups where they, we need to help to level the playing field. It doesn't mean that we'll be changing the recruitment process for them. Um, everybody has to go through the same rigor in terms of assessment to be able to secure a role but it means that we're doing our best to set people for, up for success if they've been born into poverty if they've come from a background where they haven't got parents that have even been to university you know we're trying to play a role uh, in that sphere so that we can really drive improvement in that area as well something we launched um, earlier this year that's going you know very well for us in terms of broadening uh, outreach as well as virtual work experience so um, you know we're not the first to do this by any means but a number of firms are now offering um, work experience through kind of uh, online modular learning um, uh, to, to a much broader audience um, and it's really enabling us to get out there in a, in a, in a more uh, effective way and you know if one thing the pandemic has brought it's more of that kind of virtual way of working and we're able to offer people kind of more tangible meaningful insight into what it means to work in a global law firm um, that they can then use as an impetus to be able to apply to a firm like ours or potentially another or just decide that law is not for them you know so we're really trying to, to, to kind of get coverage that way and, and appeal to a broader audience in that respect. I mentioned earlier about contextualized recruitment data. We're going a step further than that. And you know, we are really uh, overhauling the recruitment process to, to eliminate any elements of what I would call uh, adverse impact. Um, and so if we're looking for previous work experience or we're trawling through CVs to you know tick box which university they went to, or you know, all this kind of stuff, you know. From my perspective, that's not what drives outcomes, and it's been proven time and time again the correlation in terms of work performance and you know specific um, uh, uh, kind of backgrounds. You know, th th there are loose connections at best, um, and we really are trying to unearth potential in terms of the way that we recruit people. So we're looking at the way that we design our recruitment process to be able to truly do that and get behind it. So that's something moving forward that we're working on at the moment as well. There's no good doing that if you're not measuring it. So 
what we're what we're starting to embed as well is what I would call adverse impact analysis through every stage of the recruitment process and the student's journey once they join through to qualification. So we are dissecting every element, whether it's attraction event at, at, at a university or a school through to uh, the vacation scheme, the vacation scheme through to the uh, assessment centre, the assessment centre through to final interview, so on and so forth. We're, we're cutting every component to say, is there adverse impact on any particular group? And if so, why? And if we can find out the root cause of that, then we're looking to address that through the work that we do. The final thing I'll, I'll leave you with, um, and this isn't for this year, this is for future years. This is um, something that uh, you know I, I've seen in other large organisations that I think we could really benefit from is called regression analysis. So once we have more diverse workforce in the, in the workplace and they're, they've progressed through to solicitor, they're effective in role, how do we track back based on the, the um, performance that they're demonstrating the role to the recruitment process to constantly learn from uh, those employees and what we do in the market to make sure that we're appealing to the right audience in the right way and using a data driven approach rather than, you know, kind of any kind of old school mentality of, well, I came from this university or I came from this background, therefore I must be a good lawyer, debunking that myth through data so that's something we're doing over time as well so that's that's everything from me guys and and jane thank you for kind of inviting me along i hope that's useful um, i'm happy to take questions um it, so if there's anything that's come in you know by all means fire them at me and I'm, i'll do my best okay so we've got we've got a couple of questions in already so i'll read them out can you see the culture of recruiting from only slash mostly russell group unis for particular types of role changing fast enough to help to help the current generation of students or do you think it will take more time three plus years into the future before it becomes more accepted to recruit from the wider pool yeah i i think it will take longer it'd be disingenuous of me to say that this is something that's going to happen in the next year or two the dial has already moved i mean you can see from our organization that's a great case study of where you know we have been able to shift it but is the proportionality the reflective of what it is in the market in terms of the number of students studying at those universities no and, and equally as well it comes back to the regression analysis piece is there is an assumption that students from russell group university will perform better and in some cases there might be a data point that proves that you know, we're not there yet. I can't tell you specifically because everybody here is, is is more likely to be from a Russell Group University. So over time, as they come through, we'll have more data points to be able to challenge and debunk that myth. But I think it will take to her sorry take time but many of my peers in the market from other sectors you know this is absolutely like our top of the agenda in terms of a driving force so you know it will change but yeah it won't be overnight brilliant thank you james um with another question here have you made any changes for your new starters to increase retainment do you ask your suppliers supply chain to mirror your commitments so I think there's kind of two questions in there. So if we, if we just go for the first one, have you made any changes to your new starters to increase retainment? Yeah, I, I mean, retention is a, is a challenge across sectors at the moment. There's the pandemic that's driving that, obviously. There's the, uh, what's it called, the great resignation, uh, you know, and I think one of the challenges as well that's driving that in reality is, you know, it's so difficult. And I, I don't know if it's the same for you in your sector when you're bringing new people in, but certainly at entry level, it's so difficult to build connection with the brand and meaning and cohesion with colleagues and all and learning by osmosis and all of those things that we all know that perhaps we went through in our first jobs you know in the absence of that is a, is a real challenge so we, yeah, of course we're, we're competing against that constantly we're driving ourselves to really think about the lived experience that we give them so that comes through you know the supervision they receive the pastoral care access to resources around well-being and mental mental health so that's a that is a map probably the biggest focus of ours at the moment actually is how do we really support individuals and set them up for success from that perspective um and the other thing is when it comes back to measuring so um you know we we have to be in tune to what retention looks like in a more granular way and an understanding if people leave what is the root cause and how do we constantly go back to address that root cause um and something else that i'm really passionate about the team kind of getting under the skin of is is it be, again being able to measure the lived experience to say is the experience that we're delivering we say we are at 
at universities or schools, it, what they're receiving, because we, there are assumptions and of course there are conversations that happen or focus groups or whatever, but it, are we really capturing that way, that in the most effective way? So I would say that we, we're doing a number of things. We're not perfect, we're learning, and we're, but we're getting better at kind of making that more, more impactful. That's great, James. I just want to build on that because it's one of the questions I have. Do you find that when you have these have these candidates coming through um, and you bring them through your training schemes and so on, um, in terms of in terms of the retention question, I suppose, do you find that if they leave, they're going to do something else completely or are they leaving to go to your competitors? Are you doing this and, you know, is it contributing to the whole of the sector or do you find they leave and go and do different jobs entirely? I think it's, I think it's rare. Like we do a lot of through the attraction but also the recruitment process and the whole journey we do we do a lot to validate that this is really the profession that they want and and part of that comes back to being authentic in the first instance and making sure that they are you know kind of absolutely motivated to do the role so i think in it's it's not it's it, i mean it happens but i think it's quite rare that they would leave to just do something completely different you know during the the training contract or at the end of it in the majority of cases you know the, the, the average retention rate to, to share it with you or, or conversion rate, I should say, should say at the end of the two year pro training program for the legal sector is around 82 percent. It's quite specific, but I've been talking about it recently, but 82 percent. And we're pretty much bang on in terms of that. Some firms are obviously better, some firms are worse. So we're kind of where we, we should be. There's obviously more we can do. Aspirationally, I want to improve that for obvious reasons. But when people tend to leave, it's less about. It's less about the experience. It's things that sometimes we, we can't necessarily compete on. You know, for example, we are we're a massive global law firm and we're very proud of what we do. But, you know, we, we aren't Magic Circle or a big American law firm. So if, if we train somebody and one of those comes along and the individual's driver is salary, we can't really compete on that level. So there are some things, of course, we, we try to compete against that much earlier on it's about how we qualify students and make sure that we're choosing the right ones who are motivated by the right thing. But, you know, I'd be, it'd be disingenuous again to say that we retain absolutely everyone. It does happen. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, so to the second part of the question from it was from Lisa at the City of London Corporation. Do you ask your suppliers or supply chain to mirror your commitments? Yeah, and that's a good question. We, I think explicitly we probably don't. I mean, more broadly, as a firm, we're doing a lot around procurement. And of course, we're, you know, through major contracts, of course, that's something that's part of it, the diversity lens, right? But in terms of historic relationships that we've got, has that been the driving force in terms of the questions we ask them? Probably not. In terms of moving forward, it's absolutely the lens that we look through. So any of the partnerships that we do have and that we work with, the reason why we engage with that partnership is because they're able to help us recruit more diverse talent we don't struggle to hire lawyers you know we could do that ourselves we could go out and, and deliver events all day long and it wouldn't be a problem but in terms of being able to speak to a specific demographic that's why we choose the partnerships we do so so they already have commitments in place whereby that is what they live and breathe brilliant thank you james um i have a question i have another question as well so i have a lot of questions this morning um and that's it's fine. to do with the um equality and equity piece yeah. so how do you ensure that the you know the student that you know the white male students from the from the Russell Group's universities kind of don't have their noses put out of joint when they see the other candidates maybe getting additional support and additional mentoring and so on how do you, yeah. how do you manage that it's it's a good question and I suppose if I were in their shoes going back to kind of university days I, I might feel the same I think part of it is that, you know, we've got to demonstrate that we are committed to levelling the playing field and, and diversity. And it's not that we wouldn't offer support to anybody that wanted it. So, so in terms of collateral, in terms of learning support, you know, the same level of support is available to all. It's just that we're proactively targeting that of people who we feel need it and want it. So if, if somebody were to come to us and they've had a certain background, it's not that we wouldn't coach them. It's not that we wouldn't support them. It's that we're proactively targeting that group to try and drive and level the playing field, if that makes sense. That's, no, that's absolutely, that's absolutely, um, yeah, no, that's exactly what I was, I was hoping you were going to say. Um, so I think um, we're drawing to a close, but I just gonna, I'm going to ask you one more question. Um, what is the one piece of advice uh, that you would give to procurement teams or institutions who want to start doing this? What's the best piece of advice you can give them to help 
kick them kick them kick start them on that journey <laughs> interesting i i think um all the components that i've mentioned you know involve a lot to do with people and authenticity and you know the different programs and so on and so forth but i think without <laughs> without understanding the target audience and the metrics that sit behind it and the why I think that's the driving force for me um, because actually when you kind of lift the lid on some of this stuff and, and hopefully you saw that through the, the, the one slide that really builds on society it becomes really clear why you need to do this um, and it goes beyond just more profit you know more perspective and all the stuff we hear on company websites it, it, it comes down to the right thing to do so, you know, whether I'm meant to say that or not for, as, a, as a business leader, you know, that's what I believe. Um, and, you know, I think I would say that understanding the kind of demographic and how far off you are from it, um, it really, really kind of helps kind of give that sense of purpose and it then informs everything else that you do from there. Brilliant. Thank you, James. Um, I think we'll wrap up now. Um, we have no more questions in the Q&A and there's nothing in the chat either. Um, so thank you very much for joining us today, James. Um, that's been uh, yeah really valuable, really worthwhile. Um, and I'm going to hand over to Marisol now, um, who will who will close our session and get us all moving on. Thank you, James. No worries. Thanks, guys. Good to meet you all sort of in per you know, virtually. <laughs> Thanks, James, for an excellent presentation. Um, it was very interesting to understand Clyde's journey. Um, as you mentioned before, I think it was uh, very interesting what you mentioned of the um, what you call the accumulative bias and to, to understand the state of the nation impact to minorities in order to progress. So thank you so much, James, for your time.